The list is too long. Uh, it is a very prolific author. Yes, co-edited, co-authored uh, some 44 books and of course several articles. Uh, shorter essays. So, uh, without any further ado, I would like uh, uh, to turn over to you, Fred. For this, uh, couldn't be a more timely talk on uh, the world economy, the U.S. administration, and the U.S. Congress. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, including some things you did not say. Uh, it is true that USA Today said I was one of the 10 people who could change your life, but that's a partial quote. The full quote said he's one of the 10 people who could change your life that you never heard of. <laughs> And unfortunately, the second part of the quote is probably more accurate than the first part. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Ottawa. Thanks to Domenico and his colleagues at CG for inviting me. We do, and our Peterson Institute partner extensively with them, and that's here, and that's in Washington. And I'm delighted to be able to come. His timing was impeccable, as he implied himself, uh, to have me come up to talk about the outlook uh, in the U.S. Uh, literally two weeks before our coming election. Um, I will talk about two things in broad terms. One is what the election outcome is likely to do for our economy. Uh, I have the sense occasionally that Canadians care a little about the U.S. economy, uh, how it progresses, will it grow faster, will it be successful. And so I'll talk a little bit about what the election is likely to be for that. And then I'll talk about the trade issues, so uh, so current and so uh, dramatic in our minds. Uh, I'll put your minds to rest at the start. I'm quite confident you'll get your seat up. Uh, I say that not because I have any inside knowledge of the current discussions in Brussels, but because I'm a close student of the European Union and have uh, been involved with it, and studied it, and negotiated with it for most of my lengthy career in this business. And um, the way it works in Europe, uh, the big guys will sit on the Wallonians when it comes to the crunch, and uh, you'll get your seat. Uh, it may take a little while, they'll have to maneuver. It's a few steps backward, but I have confidence you'll get a little about that later on, along with some of the, um, the other trade issues. But let me start with a few words on how our election is likely to affect the economic outlook. Uh, there would be big changes in our economic outlook only if one of two things happened. One would be if Trump got elected, but of course he won't. Uh, zero, zero chance of Trump getting elected. So not to worry, Hillary Clinton will be our next president, and I'll talk about that. Uh, the second thing is a little more possible, which is that the Democrats sweep the Congress. Uh, is it, I'm apolitical. I was in a, a Republican White House. Uh, Domenico didn't mention that. I was Kissinger's deputy, very, uh, coordinating for economic policy in the Nixon White House. And then later I was in the Department of Treasury. Uh, I'm not political myself. Um, but analytically, these are the two things that, that, that could change the outcome. Uh, it's likely the Republicans retain control of the House. And I'll assume that, which means some continued gridlock. Inability of President Clinton to do what she would like to do on all counts. Um, but the majority, the Republican majority, will be reduced, and that will probably affect the outcome too. So let me talk about the economic outlook. The most likely result of a Clinton presidency uh, is positive for the U.S. economy. Uh, the U.S. economy is currently doing quite well. Uh, five, uh, GDP growth is about two, but private final demand is growing two and a half or a little more, uh, very little inflation pressure, wages rising now two and a half to three percent, we're basically at full employment under five percent. Uh, so the economy is basically doing quite well. Uh, in a way, it's somewhat similar to what's happening here in Canada. The two economies 
as usual, to some extent, moving in, uh, in some concert, and what's going on here is widely appreciated and supported, I think, by virtually all quarters of the U.S. Uh, current government's uh, uh, proceeding to deal with its problems, I think, quite effectively. Uh, but the U.S. baseline is quite positive. Uh, it's not great, but it's good, and all those variables I mentioned are looking fine. The um, growth rate is modest. GDP growing about two, but as I say, private final demand, which is a better indicator, particularly for the impact on other countries, is growing more like two and a half. The difference is that our trade balance is getting worse. It's deteriorating by about half a percent of GDP a year. That's all those Canadian exports that you're sending us. Uh, and so uh, uh, the infusion to world growth in the U.S. is better than the GDP numbers would indicate. Um, I think a Clinton administration will boost the U.S. outlook in two senses. Uh, in the short run, there will be an expansion of demand. There will be a modestly expansionary fiscal policy. It will be carried out in two or three ways. The main way is infrastructure investment. Again, something quite similar to what's going on here. Uh, President Clinton's main initiative will probably be spending of something like $50 billion in additional funding per year. On infrastructure, she'll include the creation of a new infrastructure investment bank in order to finance some of that, share the funding with private sources in order to provide a more sustainable financing base for those arrangements. That will, of course, have double positive effect for the U.S. economy. In the short run, it will expand demand, but it will also help deal with some of our structural problems, our poor infrastructure, and therefore will add to productivity growth over the medium to longer run. So that's a twofer. Um, the second thing that she'll do, and this may be the biggest uh, step she takes in terms of impact on the economy, is immigration reform. Um, she has indicated that will probably be her number one priority, as Obamacare was for President Obama. Uh, she'll try to get that done in her first year, which is the best prospect for doing something of this type. Uh, it's an area where the Republicans may well agree with her, and, cooperate, so it's got a good chance of being done, like the infrastructure, where they also tend to agree. And so if she does the kind of immigration reform she's talking about, it will actually increase the flow of immigrants into the U.S. by something like one half to one percent of GDP a year, and that adds to the labor force, it adds to the inputs to the economy, and therefore strengthens growth. So when you put those things together, starting from the base, which I prefer to use private final demand at something like two and a half, the US economy could get up to 3% growth uh, in the first couple of years of the Clinton administration, which is not bad. We've been growing now for seven years in a row. It's a very long expansion, uh, but it's not out of steam. There are no imbalances that are apparent. And so I think uh, a continuation and the acceleration of that type is quite, lucky, uh, quite likely. And the only real question about the US economy these days is where it grows in a range between two and three percent. If you're a pessimist, you take two. If you're an optimist, you take three. Uh, I'm an optimist, but also I think uh, with the new administration, new enthusiasm for policy, we can probably get it up to three percent, and that will then be helpful for our trading partners, like Canada in particular, as well as ourselves. There are some other things that the Clinton administration will probably do. One is to put in place some new domestic safety nets to deal with the social consequences of uh, dynamic economic change. And this is very important in terms of trade policy, and I'll come back to the linkage there. Uh, the real problem we have with trade policy that we've seen in our campaigns, particularly with Bernie Sanders on the left, as well as Trump's more irrational charges from his side of the spectrum. But the real problem, what's ignited the angst and anxiety of the public that has uh, led those approaches to resonate, is the perceived adverse effect on jobs and wages of trade agreements in particular and trade and globalization more broadly. Now we know from a whole series of studies, including ones we've done at my institute, but lots of others, that globalization, while it adds to those issues, it adds to those problems, is a minor cause, maybe 15, 20%. But it does add to them. There's no doubt that it has uh, globalization has losers and downsides and costs as well as overall benefits. And the U.S. has done a uniquely poor job of responding to the problem 
of the folks that have been on the downside of trade and globalization. Uh, all of our studies show that the benefit cost ratio to the U.S. from globalization in general, NAFTA in particular, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, coming up, is about 20 to 1. The economy gains about $20 for every one that it loses in adjustment cost. So the benefit cost ratio is huge, and it's obviously desirable to go ahead with those agreements, and that's why in the past they've always gotten uh, approval. But there are those downsides. There are a significant number in absolute terms, 50 to 100,000 people a year in the case of TPP at all probability. And we have done, as I said, a singularly poor job of providing assistance to deal with the genuine problems of those folks. And since their problems are highly concentrated, uh, you lose a job, wind up taking a job at much lower income, uh, your losses are much more concentrated than the benefits to those who gain from low import prices and even higher export uh, wages. Uh, it has a disproportionately negative political effect. And that's what the countries can see. Again, globalization is only a small component of the broader problem of jobs and wages, but you can't vote against robots, as we always say. So you can vote against trade agreements, and that takes the brunt of the scapegoating and the problem. But back to Hillary Clinton, she would be putting in place, for purely domestic reasons, new safety net programs, a better earned income tax credit, what we call wage insurance for people who do have to take lower wages when they lose a job, uh, a higher minimum wage, a better trade adjustment program, better lifetime learning and retraining programs, a whole range of things which she would want to do for purely domestic reasons, but which will help change the framework for trade by dealing with the downsides of costs of losers, and I'll come back later to why that might be so important. That's another likely outcome. A final one that I would mention is corporate tax reform. Um, both parties in the U.S. have been a bit shaken by all these corporate inversions, you know, U.S. firms going abroad to get tax benefits, escape the U.S. Uh, tax system. The recent Apple case in Europe has dramatized that. And so this may be an area where, again, you could get bipartisan agreement to lower the, uh, the nominal uh, tax rate on corporations turn for getting rid of a lot of loopholes, and maybe changing the whole nature of our taxation of foreign income, where the U.S. is now unique in the world in pursuing uh, uh, a global or worldwide tax system rather than a territorial system, where you only tax the earnings that are made within your borders. Uh, so we could get some serious tax reform at long last. Republicans have always wanted to link that to some other things, but again, Maybe in the first year or two of a new administration where the Republicans want to show some ability to govern, uh, possibly some of that might be done. The positive note is to think back to when Bill Clinton was president and Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House and the Republicans controlled the Congress and a lot got done. Remember, the U.S. moved into budget surplus for three years running, big budget surpluses uh, only 15 years ago. The whole welfare system was reformed. Uh, big changes were made, positive changes, uh, in that kind of political environment. So it's not to be uh, ruled out that that could happen again. Uh, the bad news is that, at least in the campaign, um, Secretary Clinton has not talked about any kind of concerted effort to improve productivity growth, which is the underlying problem in our economy, as I think in yours. Uh, there's been no effort to focus on how to deal with the budget problem. Uh, we don't have a short-term budget problem, but we certainly have a long-term one as our entitlement spending keeps going up and up as our, our population ages, and there's been absolutely no discussion of what to do about that. Indeed, Secretary Clinton's talked about increasing Social Security benefits, which is the wrong way to go, and of course would make the problem worse. So there are some downsides. We still have some significant problems out there. But on balance, I think her program, at least as best one can define it from the campaign, and as best one could judge what would be supported and agreed by a Congress which probably will have Democratic control of the Senate, but still Republican control of the House, uh, what could get through that process uh, 
kind of the optimistic assumption that gridlock uh, can be avoided at least for the first couple of years. And then I think the U.S. economy, as I said, could be growing three instead of two, could be putting some steps in place on the investment side, on the supply side of labor, which we were mentioned before, safety net program, that would increase productivity and therefore uh, lead to at least a modestly more optimistic outlook for the U.S. economy going forward. So I think as you and Canada look to your southern neighbor as always a big force, a big factor in how your own economy can prosper, uh, I think the outlook ought to be uh, on the whole quite bullish, quite favorable, and what's been a reasonably good outlook uh, in development over the last few years will get better. Um, it's a high degree of continuity, in essence, from the Obama policies, which are say have been pretty successful, uh, but with some added upside outcomes that I think are likely to uh, uh, improve the outlook both in the short run and the longer run. So then let me turn to the area where the Clinton administration would have a big difference from the Obama administration, and that's on trade policy. Uh, I say a big difference, but I would start by reminding everybody that when President Obama came into office in 2009, he did not want to touch trade policy at all. It was the last thing he wanted to do. Uh, he didn't want to rile his, uh, his uh, AFL-CIO, his labor supporters. Uh, he wanted to get Obamacare through with their support. Uh, he knew trade was highly contentious, highly volatile, particularly with his own base, and he didn't want to touch it. He winds up with the most ambitious trade negotiating program in the history of the United States negotiating simultaneously the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, plus a whole series of uh, plurilateral agreements in the World Trade Organization on services, on environmental goods, on high-tech products, uh, on government procurement. Uh, the Obama administration has the most ambitious trade negotiating agenda in the history of the United States. If you say a lot, because we've had some before, you know it, NAFTA, WTO agreements and the like. Um, Obama got there not because he all of a sudden decided trade was great for the American economy, but for foreign policy reasons. What essentially happened, I happen to know I was in the middle of it, but Lee Kuan Yew <laughs> visited Washington in late 2009, Obama's first year in office, and just told him flat out and very forcibly that unless you took some economic initiatives in Asia, Mr. President, you're turning the area over to China. And Lee Kuan Yew put it just that long ago. And President Obama, to his great credit, got the message. And so reinserted the U.S. into the TPP negotiations and then the rest followed. Once the U.S. did TPP with Asia, how could it turn down to Europeans when they wanted to do a similar agreement and those are the old allies and all that? So then you wound up with these two mega regional deals which, together with the WTO stuff, winds up as this very ambitious trade agenda. But it was done for foreign policy reasons, and that's important to keep in mind, because I think President Clinton will be inevitably drawn back into trade policy, whatever she says now, for foreign policy reasons. And I'll try to describe how I think that's likely to happen. Um, on trade policy in a Clinton administration, there's good news, bad news, and a big uncertainty. Uh, the good news, of course, to you all is that NAFTA is safe. Uh, Trump's not going to get elected, so you're not going to have somebody uh, abrogating NAFTA. And a lot. Technical point, quite important, you may or may not be aware of. Uh, even if Trump came into office and withdrew from NAFTA, which he might or might not do, but even if he withdrew from NAFTA, that would not automatically increase U.S. tariffs against Canada. Those were done through a separate set of presidential proclamations, which would have to be undone with congressional approval in order to undo the trade effects of NAFTA. So it might not even be nearly so bad as it sounds, despite all Trump's huffing and puffing about renegotiating and having to do the deal again or to uh, avoid it. Uh, having said that, I cannot resist telling you a story which goes back to the negotiation of the original U.S.-Canada free trade agreement in the late 1980s, which some of you will remember. Uh, you may also remember 
that the opposition in your parliament opposed that agreement. And the leader of the opposition was one Lloyd Axworthy. And Lloyd came to visit me just before the vote in the parliament. And he said, Fred, why, why should Canada agree to this free trade agreement with the United States? And I said, Lloyd, it's an insurance policy against the U.S. doing something crazy that might really hurt you guys. I couldn't fail to remember that when Trump was fulminating <laughs> about pulling out of NAFTA. Parenthetically, uh, Lloyd, after hearing my answer, said, yeah, but to take out an insurance policy, you have to pay a premium. And I said, yeah. What is it about the premium in this agreement that you don't like? Well, he didn't have a ready answer, which surprised me. But after about 30 seconds, he said, you know, the next time there's an energy crisis, we won't be able to block our oil exports to you, as they had done, you may remember, in the 1970s. To which I said, if that's the price, if that's the premium you're worried about paying, please pay it. It would be in your interest as well as ours. But let's go on with the agreement. You better take out the insurance policy. Anyway, it almost had to be paid off. And if I'm wrong, if Trump gets elected, it uh, still will stand you in very good stead to have that. But I think the good news is, with Clinton's election, they have to say not to worry. And Clinton, to her credit, I'm going to criticize her here in a moment on TPP, Clinton, to her credit, has strongly, strongly attacked Trump for his generalized attack on globalization and trade in general. She's erred in proposing TPP, but as to Trump's generalized negative stance on all trade, all trade deals, she has strongly, strongly opposed that, calling him rightly extreme, off base, out of touch. And so in terms of overall approach to trade policy, uh, Hillary Clinton is not nearly as bad as you would think from her having rejected TPP. However, the bad news on trade policy, and again, we're together in that as partners, Canada and the United States, uh, is that she has come out against TPP as it is currently arranged. Now, that's a very important caveat because when she says, I'm against it before, during, and after the election, as always with the caveat, TPP as it is now constructed, which obviously leaves her then running room to reconstruct it and come back to it. Now, admitting that wish is at least partly father to my thought, I will predict fearlessly that she'll come back to TPP. Now, if, if it's still on the plate when she takes over. I spent three hours at the White House yesterday with our team there that is going to be trying as its number one overall priority in the lame duck session of Congress after the election to get TPP passed. The president has been absolutely clear. He keeps telling his people, he takes half of every meeting, they say, telling them they have to do everything conceivably possible to get TPP through. And so they're going to make a major, major effort. The problem is, of course, it's not up to the president, it's up to Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House. And so Paul Ryan has got to be willing both to support the substance and to whip his caucus, his Republican caucus, sufficiently to hold the majority of Republicans, 190, that voted in favor of trade promotion authority a year ago, because you're not going to get more than the 28 Democrats who voted for that. Republicans have to carry it, and that means Paul Ryan has to carry it. And his position is weakened. It's not clear what his substantive view is. So it's a somewhat long shot. And if I have to predict yes or no, I'd have to say it's unlikely that the agreement will go through. But it's certainly not impossible. The White House is going to put every conceivable amount of pressure they can on the effort to get it through. And in fact, it would, of course, behoove incoming President Clinton if it were taken off her plate by being approved out. But if it's not, Again, I would fearlessly predict that while she'll have to continue to oppose it for a while, she'll come back to it. But I would guess it would be two or three years, during which time she would try to erect some of these safety nets that then would enable her to convincingly say, now we can deal with the downsized costs of losers. Maybe put some things in place on currency, which is one of the big complaints that uh, is also voiced by the opponents of TPP. 
he has to sort of level playing field because of currency manipulation. Uh, you could make domestic policy changes that will deal with that one as well. So I would predict that we would come back to it in several years. Now that sounds bad, but remember it's not you. You again will remember from NAFTA, when Bill Clinton became president, he didn't just pick it up right away. He in fact delayed for nine months before he even decided whether to go for it. Then when he did, acted effectively, got it through the Congress. Uh, when President Obama came in, he inherited the free trade agreement with Korea and Colombia and Panama that had been negotiated by Bush 43. He didn't take it up for three years. And then finally did, got it through the Congress. So it's nothing new for US trade agreements to be negotiated by one president, carried to the Congress with a new president, who in order to justify doing so, makes some changes, as was done in the Labor and Environment Side Agreements in NAFTA, some auto provisions in Chorus, uh, and would have to be done in the ways I described uh, in TPP. The point is not to despair, even if TPP does not get through in the lame duck session, it will still be on the plate, it's not gonna die. I think it will come back, again, broadly for foreign policy reasons, but once the legitimate criticisms that have been made are assuaged at least enough to bring along a majority of Congress in order to uh, uh, get it passed uh, several years down the road. There'll be a delay, so Canada and other parties to the TPP agreement will have to uh, be willing to sit still uh, for that delay. Uh, I wouldn't see why that would cause a problem for Canada or Mexico, since we already have free trade agreements. Might be a little trickier for Malaysia, Vietnam, some countries that uh, have had to make some pretty big concessions to uh, participate in the TPP. Japan seems committed to the agreement, uh, Prime Minister Abe using it to pursue domestic reform. Um, and incidentally, in case you're not aware of that, the TPP is to a large extent a U.S.-Japan free trade agreement. Uh, something like two-thirds of the impact, the economic impact of the TPP is because of free trade between the world's largest and third largest economies, the U.S. and Japan. So uh, that is the bulk of the agreement. Uh, Japan is banking heavily on that. Plus, uh, it's a big winner because it frees up a lot of markets in Japan that are now uh, cosseted in which Prime Minister Abe uh, wants to open up through uh, using the leverage of the external pressure through TPP. Uh, so I think it'll hang together, uh, but that is an issue. The final trade policy point, and now I'll end my remark, uh, goes to the Europeans. Uh, and I bravely said before, I think you'll get your seat in, because at the end of the day, the Germans and French won't let the Wallonian veto, uh, something that would make the EU look so ridiculous in uh, everybody's eyes. Uh, as, uh, as some wise sage has said, if, uh, if Europeans can't negotiate a trade agreement with Canada, uh, what can they do? Well, uh, they could do other things, but I think it's a fair comment, and uh, I think the Europeans are a bit stunned by that and, and will overcome it. Um, for the United States, the interesting question, of course, is what will happen to our negotiation with the Europeans, the transatlantic trade investment partnership, the TTIP. And if I'm right, that the Trans-Pacific Agreement will be hibernating for several years as President Clinton makes some policy changes to enable her to go back to it. One interesting possibility would be for TTIP to jump the queue and to do it first instead of waiting until after the TPP. Now that, of course, would require the Europeans to get their act together and be for it. But if you gave them that option, uh, I suspect that might be a possibility. Uh, remember that from a U.S. political standpoint, the TTIP does not raise any of the problems that the protectionists or anti-trade people normally voice, namely low wages, low labor standards, or low environmental standards. Those are the three issues that they always raise. None of those apply to Europe. So the logic in opposing TTIP uh, escapes most people, um, and even in the past, the AFL-CIO and protectionist senators have said they would support freer trade with Europe. 
So if we wanted to keep U.S. trade policy moving forward to some extent, but the TPP was having to be delayed for a while for the reasons I indicated, uh, one alternative would be to move ahead with the TTIP. Again, that would require the Europeans, who have not been very helpful on TTIP so far, to become much more activist and much more participatory. That in turn would relate to CETA. If they could do CETA, that would boost their credibility as well as their domestic political uh, uh, path breaking in order to move down that path. So I think all these things relate to each other and, uh, and go very far to chart the future for the world trading system. Um, let me conclude by trying to draw those latter points together. Um, we know that there have now been very strong backlashes against globalization in many of the major countries, certainly in the United States and certainly in Europe. Uh, and less so here in Canada, but you even get traces of it here. Um, to the extent that, without being too hyperbolic, one could suggest that the world trading system, indeed the whole world economic arrangement, that has provided the prosperity and security glue for the last 70 years, is an existential risk. Uh, we've had Brexit, we could have a blow up of CETA, we could have a blow up of the Trans Pacific Partnership. The U.S. could backslide significantly uh, if it goes down the path that has been strongly suggested in the current election. Even without Trump's successes, Bernie Sanders, even Secretary Clinton, by the end of her movement on TPP, have indicated a political response to this deep anxiety and odds that we've seen in the American body politic. As a U.S. citizen who's been involved in this business for a very long time, I have always worried most about my own country. I have always felt the biggest risk to globalization was the United States because it has always had some degree of nativist tendency, protectionism. It's a big country, much globalized over the last 30 or 40 years, but still not as dependent on external forces as most countries and so could at least plausibly argue that some backsliding or at least standing still on trade uh, would not be so negative. And so I think we may be at an existential moment in terms of how the global economy can continue uh, to work with each other, try to expand uh, our international trade, investment, migration, and other relationships. Uh, which could, if handled poorly, particularly in the U.S. and Europe, uh, go badly off the rails to the great uh, detriment of all of us. Uh, I would not predict it will do that. I've suggested that at least a couple of these things uh, will get back on track. I would not even be surprised, to tell you the truth, if the Brits find a way to reverse the Brexit vote. Uh, I think that's quite possible a couple of years out, once they see the terms, they'll have a new election, uh, the public may reject those terms and so they may stay in. Um, so all the things could be reversed, but they also could stay off the track and if new shocks occur, uh, could make it even worse. So I think we are at a really, really critical moment for the future of the world economy, for the rules and institutions that our two countries, Canada and the United States, have played such a central role in creating, nurturing over the last 70 years. Uh, if we went that way, it would be a huge, huge mistake, a huge, huge cost to all of us in economic terms, in national security terms, uh, but it uh, simply says that all of us work on these things, care about them, have got to really redouble our efforts, help each other, and try to do everything we can to get things back on track. It's a pleasure to be here. I've greatly enjoyed meeting with all of you, visiting Ottawa again, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions that you may want to raise. Thank you. Jeff Goh, former Canadian diplomat, but I 
at the time I used to meet you in the late 80s when we were talking FT adjustment and you inspired me quite often about that. I just want to start with your concluding remarks because on the one hand, I think your, the whole presentation is absolutely on the money. But on the other hand, if I look at Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, not to name him, aren't they in a way revealing a fundamental issue that the US economy has grown to such a level of inequality that there are many people, and that's why you probably have 40 million people following Trump. And that kind of growing inequality, to what extent does it impact on all the things that you have mentioned, the rejection of TPP, the politics around it and all that, which could actually threaten your existential moment. But I think the fundamental issue of inequality is really what is pervading the negativity to with globalization. Well, inequality is certainly a problem in the United States. It's gotten much, much worse, of course, and it's widely recognized, and so it does make things a lot worse. However, all the political science analysis says that inequality per se is not a huge political problem. It's a problem when the absolute level of median wages and the prosperity of the broad population stagnates. And on that reading, the more serious problem, not inequality per se, but the fact that the average levels of income in the US have basically been flat for 30 or 40 years. Wages in particular have been flat. Wages and benefits taken together have gone up because of health insurance premiums, but take more wages have been flat. And that, we think, is the more serious underlying problem. And that's why to correct the problem, you've got to get the economy growing faster with wages going up, and that requires some distributional policies as well as macro policy. But it also requires the safety net efforts to deal with the lower and lower middle income groups. Um, now that could be right or wrong in this case. Uh, as I said also mm -hmm. earlier, globalization, while a factor in all the things, including the increase in inequality, is only a modest factor. And so if you could get the overall picture headed back in the right direction, then we think a lot of the attack on globalization would dissipate. So that's the response. Uh, I think that's right, can't prove it, uh, but we've got a lot of analytical work that supports that, and I think it points in the direction of a policy course that can put things back on track, but will take a while to do so. Fortunately, a Clinton administration would be inclined to move that way for purely domestic reasons, and the one thing I'm trying to add to that stew is to say, link that very explicitly to the trade side so that the downsides that do exist from globalization will be perceived to be responded to by the new set of policies. Uh, Robert Carlyle from Great Diplomat. Uh, congratulations, that was a really very, very interesting presentation. Two issues I'd like to raise with you. How does Clinton try to bridge them? the divide between the Trump supporters and her uh, supporters or herself with her policies, because this, this group is really in very much apart, very angry, very annoyed, and, and ready to go to the wall with, with Trump. So that's, that's probably 25 to 40% of the electorate. And the second is, is I'd like to know what the what's going on in the Philippines and President Duterte, if you want to to know. Um, he has some change in the last 20 years. Um, how does that affect the U.S. foreign policy in Asia Pacific? Well, the second is a very good question. I don't know enough about Duterte to really say whether he's going to stick with his divorce from the U.S. or you know, some days he's for it, some days he's against it. Um, but uh, assume worst case, and he does team up with Beijing, obviously big complication to the U.S. But uh, I would think of anything, it would uh, redouble the U.S. effort to work with the other countries in the region. 
if you lose one big part of your alliance system, you got to shore up the other parts of your alliance system. So I don't think in any way it would divert the U.S. from the pivot or the rebalance to Asia, and it might even make it more important, which in turn would then mean that the TPP, which is the economic heart of the whole pivot, and that's why losing it would be so critical, uh, it would make the TPP even stronger. Uh, uh, I don't know if you all are aware of this, but uh, NAFTA was, uh, at the end of the day, steered through our Congress, uh, not uh, on anything to do with economics, but on national security grounds. It was sold to the, to the Congress by General Colin Powell, who at the time was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and went to the Congress and said, if you don't agree to NAFTA, one of my successors may well have to put five U.S. divisions on our southern border to protect against the failed Mexico. <clears throat> and the senator said, General, where do we sign? Uh, that's what got it through. Uh, every major U.S. foreign, uh, every major U.S. trade initiative in the whole post-war period has been eventually uh, sold to the Congress and approved, not on economic grounds, but on foreign policy grounds. And the Duterte case in the Philippines is showing how dramatically important that would be now. So I would say, perversely, it would enhance the importance and the case for uh, doing the trade agreement, though subsequently, sure, it puts a big hole in the alliance system. Uh, on your first point, uh, probably right, at least for a while, the Trumpistas will uh, continue to hate Hillary Clinton. The question is how much of a change that is from the political situation under President Obama. A lot of them hated President Obama too. Uh, the Tea Party, the right wing, uh, have opposed everything he's done uh, because he was doing it. They tried to torpedo everything of his from Obamacare uh, through his climate change efforts uh, to his trade agreements. So. It's, it's virulent, you're absolutely right. Uh, how much it changes the political outlook in terms of either public support or congressional support is not clear. I think it's gonna depend a lot on how badly she beats Trump. Uh, I think there's a, there's a realistic chance of a very substantial majority where she wins 350 up to 400 electoral votes and it really does sweep the field, including lots of states that have not been a Democrat column for a long time. If that's the case, that will take a lot of the wind out of the sails of the Trump supporters. Um, the Republican Party, of course, is gonna have to make some big decisions on how they pick up the pieces from this mess. And one of the questions there is whether they try to reestablish some degree of credibility uh, of their ability to govern. And that's why I think there's at least a chance that they might agree to some of President Clinton's initiatives and uh, at least try to start reestablishing some degree of trust with the broader public because we know after this episode that the Trump following is not enough for them to win elections and maybe even to preserve their, their congressional well, pretty, pretty clear. So uh, that would be my answer. If, if we're surprised that he does better and even comes close, but well, it wins, then, uh, then the problem you pose is greater, not least because then he'll really claim that it was rigged, that he was cheated, and he may go on like that for a long time. If he's blown out, not very credible. So that's why, that's why not only the outcome is important, but the margin of the outcome is important, and the congressional dimension of the outcome <clears throat> Fred, uh, I'm Cameron McKay. I'm a director general on the trade side of the Department of Colonial Affairs. You spoke about uh, the mega regionals, TPP and TTIP. Uh, you touched on CETA risks to the global economy. What about the WTO? Uh, and what are the medium to long term prospects for a comprehensive global trade agreement? several times in the past, of course, but what's the future? Well, I'll give you what you may think is a contradictory answer. Uh, I think the WTO is doing great. And I'll tell you why. And I don't think there's any chance 
in the next couple of decades for a global multilateral trade route. Now, if you think that sounds contradictory, let me explain. I think the WTO is doing great for two reasons. One, it is the recognized, effective dispute settlement mechanism for resolving trade conflicts among countries all over the world. The U.S. takes China to court, China takes the U.S. to court, you take us to court. Uh, all manner of disputes are pretty effectively resolved by the WTO, the closest thing the world has to a functioning international court. The reason, one reason the trade policy and globalization have gotten so much difficulty is that every interest group wants to hijack the WTO process for its purposes. The intellectual property guy said, hey, here's an institution that works. Let's get our rules embedded in there and use their dispute settlement mechanism. The labor standard folks say, ah, the hell with the ILO, it's ineffectual. But the WTO, wow, they've got rules that work. They've got a dispute settlement process. Let's get our stuff in there. The environmental people say the same thing. And all of that lards more and more issues into the trading system, which then begins to grow in, result, in, in response because a lot of the people in those areas don't like the intrusion of the WTO into their process. Uh, we see that all over the United States. Uh, some of the leading opponents of trade and globalization don't really oppose trade, what they oppose is the fact that the global trade system intrudes in their previously cozy little bailiwick uh, where they had the processes all set up for their benefit and they had rules that they liked and understood. All of a sudden, here's this international institution that they know nothing about, have no access to, don't understand, uh, intruding in their space. And so it's actually the success of the WTO which has caused a lot of these problems. WTO is the only game in town that has an effective mechanism of that type. So it's led to problems, but it is, a, to me, an instance of the WTO success. The other reason I think the WTO was a huge success is because of all these plurilateral agreements I mentioned. I mean, I don't know how much you detail or you know about this, but the information technology agreement frees up basically half a trillion dollars of world trade in goods and services and high-tech products, agreed in a plurilateral associated with, though not technically part of the WTO. Big negotiation going now on environmental goods, uh, likely even by the end of this year maybe, to free up several hundred billion dollars worth of trade uh, by eliminating tariffs on environmental goods. Um, the uh, uh, Trade and Services Agreement, which picks up the huge sector of services, which of course is the vast bulk of all of our economy. Very large shares of that are traded, unlike uh, what people think. Services sector is not haircuts and, and bandies. It's uh, architects and engineers and things that are highly tradable, and in fact are traded both within countries and across the border. Uh, in the US, the business services sector generates twice as many jobs as the entire manufacturing sector. And yet, it's a tiny share of our total trade. In addition, we happen to have a $300 billion annual surplus in services trade, as compared with an $800 billion deficit in manufacturing trade. Services is good in merchantless terms, as well as the fact that it makes up 75 or 80 percent of our economy. In your case, I looked at the number coming up, it's about 72, I think. Uh, so here's this big negotiation on a sector that was essentially left out of the Uruguay round. Uh, some pieces of it, finance, some high tech, have been picked up in separate negotiations. But now there's an aggregate negotiation to free up trade and services. Uh, again, not technically part of the WTO because it doesn't include every one of the 160 plus members, but uh, it's what's called a plurilateral and the countries in it, about 50, make up 85 to 90% of world trade in the sector. So it's pretty close to mobile. And once that uh, critical mass agrees, you can be sure from the ITA president, almost everybody else will sign on as well. And all this is around the WTO 
being done in Geneva, uh, associated with the WTO, and I'm not only willing but eager to give the WTO credit for all that and view that as a successful uh, use of its institutional format. Now, I agree it would be nice to get a global agreement in which all the countries dealt with all the issues, but we have found out from the now almost 15 years of decimatory effort on the Doha route, it just doesn't work. And in fact, my prediction, I wrote an article on this almost 20 years ago called Globalizing Free Trade. My guess is that doing these regional and mega-regional deals uh, is the best route back to global free trade. Because once these mega-regionals get in place, they're going to look at each other and say, hmm, why don't we put these things together instead of leaving them separate and competitive? So what I dubbed competitive liberalization, I think will lead down the road to a series of bilateral and regional and mega-regional agreements, maybe back to the global free trade table. But that will take another couple of decades. <clears throat> Great talk. Um, question, Hillary Clinton, uh, when Bill Clinton became president, was given the health file for a, a while. Uh, didn't do too well on it. Uh, now she's going to be president. Uh, she's probably going to have another go at it. So could you talk about two things? One is, what do you think she'll do with Obamacare? And two, uh, is she going to try and institute some sort of national drug pricing uh, negotiated by the government? Uh, across the board? Well, those are good questions. And I never like to cop out, but I'm not, I'm not enough of an expert on the details of uh, either Obamacare or drug pricing to give you a really thoughtful answer. Um, I think she'll try to mobilize new negotiating tactics with both the drug companies and the insurance companies to try to limit the rise of costs. You know, for the first really five or six years of Obamacare, the big surprise was that healthcare costs were rising at a much lower rate than had been projected and had been occurring before. Now it looks like we're getting a new spike of increases because of the adverse effects on the bottom line, basically, of the insurance company. And they're backing away from the regional arrangements and uh, uh, some of the institutional foundations of Obamacare. So I'm sure that one of her priorities will be to try to fix that, but exactly how, I'm afraid I can't tell you. But I'm sure that'll be a, one of her priorities because she fully shares the goals of Obamacare. Uh, they have, it has of course, dramatically increased the insurance coverage of America. But, and that's the source of the problem, it's done so by covering the people that are most likely to get sick. And it's the healthiest, and this was always the fear, right, from the start. The healthiest people have opted not to go into the Obamacare, pay its costs, they better pay the fines, and that then deprives the insurance pool of the kind of uh, uh, diversified blend of people like to get sick and people like to stay healthy that are necessary for insurance to basically work. So an answer has got to be found to that. And I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it'll be high on her priority list. Sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't do better. John? Fred, uh, John Curtis. One of the uh, relevance in today's world is, uh, is the fact of your generation and mine called industrial policy, innovation policy. Uh, government supporting innovative activity uh, through subsidies, through spending, through uh, bringing in highly talented people. How do you see this affecting the trade system as we go forward? It's, it's one thing to say, yeah, we have to get these constructs back together. In fact, I'm building on Cam's question, but with the issues changing underneath, uh, broadband, for example, expanding up. How does this affect the design of the trade system as we look ahead? 
Well, I'm not sure, John, how much it affects it. I, I would distinguish between the two terms you tended to use interchangeably, innovation policy, industrial policy. As you well know, industrial policy usually has the implication of supporting individual sectors or picking winners or losers to use the pejorative uh, characterization of it. Uh, I don't see any trend in that direction. I mean, Chinese do it, but I don't see much likelihood that our market economies are going to do that. Um, innovation policy, R&D spending, uh, venture capital promotion and the like, are things we already do. You could argue whether we do enough or not enough, uh, but the case for those relates to the fundamental question of productivity growth. Go back to that, that's of course central to achieving prosperity in any of our countries. And it would therefore have a favorable spin-off effect on trade policy and improve everybody's competitiveness and therefore make them more willing to engage in international trade. But, uh, and so it's, it's a part of your broad competitiveness strategy, which in turn relates directly to your trade policy. But I guess I don't see anything dramatically new about it or anything that, or any policy set on those issues that would be likely to dramatically change the trade policy outlook, either substantively or politically. Maybe I'm missing something. If I am, you tell me, you tell me afterward. Yeah. Uh, Barry McLaughlin, uh, McLaughlin Media. Uh, a terrifically bracing and straightforward presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, quick question. Um, you know, you can look at Hillary Clinton, her administration through the lens of her promises, or you can look at it through the lens of her influencers. Who is really influencing her? What is in her mind as president? Is she going to be influenced by the Bernie Sanders wing that she's still stinging from? Or is her instincts back to her Senate days of trying to work across the aisle and trying to find common ground? Do you have any sense of who her key influencers will be? No, I don't think we know that. Uh, I do think, <laughs> to, uh, to use a favorite Bill Clinton term, she'll try to triangulate among the, uh, the forces you mentioned. Uh, she has to try to keep both of them happy in order to have a working majority in the Congress. So uh, depending on the issue, she'll have to accommodate one or the other group. The normal way to do that is to accommodate Group A on one set of issues and Group B on another set of issues and try to make them both happy to some extent and therefore willing to support her overall program. Uh, but that's, I think, her inclination and basically what she will try to do. Uh, it means requiring either of those sets of actors to accept things they don't like on some particular issues in return for something elsewhere. But I think that's probably the only course she can reasonably pursue, and I would guess that's what she'll do. One last question. Swin Yershevsky, I'm also a former Affairs candidate. I want to go back to the theme that Ferry raised. Uh, I was very much chuffed and reassured by the first half of your presentation on uh, what can look forward to legislatively. A lot of that depends on the Republican Party coming to its senses. But there are reasons to think that that won't happen. Um, first of all, the Republican leadership did not part company with Trump on matter of principle or policy, but on his misogynism. Secondly, there's reason to think that Trump supporters, it's not just an economic phenomenon, it's also a nativist and cultural phenomenon. And thirdly, the gerrymandering which has disfigured so much of US politics, may result in a Republican president, which is even more radical and even more intransigent than what we have now. Is that a sensible view or am I being alarmist? No, I think uh, all of those three things are quite possible, um, particularly the last one. The gerrymandering has demonstrably led to a lot of the polarization we see. and. That's likely to continue at least for a while. We've got another census coming up in four years. Uh, there are various court cases that are trying to rule out the extreme forms of gerrymandering that have been done by the various state legislatures. 
But at best, that's a 10 year process to turn around and who knows it may not succeed at all. So the polarization is quite, uh, quite likely to continue. Uh, that does lead, that's one of the underlying uh, sources of gridlock. Um, you're certainly also right that the Republican Party has, uh, has dramatically committed Harry Carey in this election. Uh, you hope that they would see the light after the 2012 election, where they lost, but not you know, as badly as they probably will this time, um, they did their famous autopsy of the party uh, and said, uh, here's what we have to do in order to get back in the game. And of course, item number one was to start catering to Hispanics. Well, instead, their nominee decided that he was going to exclude Hispanics. So it didn't exactly follow the, uh, the autopsy. Um, so maybe this time they'll go back to that and say, eh, we tried something else, didn't work very well. Uh, but that's hope. And you're right, they have demonstrated a total lack of courage, uh, a total spinelessness in responding to, uh, to Trump. Now, there have been a few exceptions. Uh, Governor Kasich is the dramatic exception uh, including uh, trade policy, he's been very aggressively advocating uh, support for TPP. Uh, we're going to host him at a big event at my institute in a couple of weeks. He's going to speak out once again. He did in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just uh, frontally taking on Trump and on that particular issue, but he's done it on other issues as well. So there are a few profiles of courage. Uh, but not yet enough. And so the Republican Party would have to rally around Kasich or somebody else, but you can't find too many others that high profile that have defied Trump. And uh, it's going to be a long climb back from, for them. So now, if, if, that, if that condemns them to kind of permanent, I mean, some people have even talked about the demise of the Republican Party, that the Republican Party could fade into. Uh, uh, Irrelevant, as some U.S. parties have done in the past and in other countries as well. So it's not unknown that parties are unable to get their act together and literally disappear and get replaced by something new. That's that's conceivable if the Republicans stay on the, the tack that they've uh, they've exhibited in this campaign, and the few people who have been willing to stand up for principle could go off and start something else. But then that would condemn them. Uh, minority states for a while longer. So yeah, what you say is certainly not impossible. It's a sad story for our democracy and our effort to uh, govern in a reasonably centrist and bipartisan way, but, uh, but certainly not impossible. I would like to ask uh, Domenico Lombardi of PC to please thank our Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Fred, for this uh, very refreshing talk, especially compared to where we started off uh, in my introductory remarks. So I would uh, suggest we, at least myself, I'm going to um, have three takeaways, three main takeaways from your talk. Uh, I think the first is that uh, the U.S. administrations, with some exceptions, but uh, U.S. administrations tend to uh, be pragmatic vis-a-vis -vis their trade policies when they come in office and not too ideological. So in a sense, this is a good sign, especially if uh, uh, you know, the Clinton administration were indeed to come into office. The second is that we need to better understand analytically and in terms of the most appropriate uh, policy instruments, how we can face, how we can mitigate the backlash vis-a-vis -vis trade, globalization. It's not something that arises, you know, as a reason abruptly. Clearly there are reasons that we need to investigate, and this is true especially for think tanks like, like us. And, and therefore, you know, uh, thinking of the most appropriate instruments, this could go a long way in terms of uh, providing a politically favorable climate in which, this, um, in which new trade agreements might take place. And the final point is that you know, based on all this, the current uncertainty that we're experiencing vis-a-vis CEDA, 
in terms of Canada, EU, but also you know in terms of TPP um, and uh, uh, TTIP vis-à-vis uh, -vis US and the EU. Uh, so this might be a temporary standstill, uh, and, and 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 actually uh, you know we might. Be Sit on them while lower deals when it comes to the crunch, and uh, you'll get your seat. Uh, it may take a little while, they'll have to maneuver. It's a few steps backward, but I have confidence you'll get a little about that later on, along with some of the, um, the other trade issues. But let me start with a few words on how our election is likely to affect the economic outlook. Uh, there would be big changes in our economic outlook only if one of two things happened. One would be if Trump got elected, but of course he won't. Uh, zero, zero chance of Trump getting elected. So not to worry, Hillary Clinton will be our next president, and I'll talk about that. Uh, the second thing is a little more possible, which is that the Democrats sweep the Congress. Uh, is it, I'm apolitical, I was in a, a Republican White House, Medical didn't mention that. I was Kissinger's deputy, running the coordinating foreign economic policy of the Nixon White House, and then later I was in the Department of Treasury. Uh, I'm not political myself, um, but analytically, these are the two things that, that, that could change the outcome. Uh, it's likely the Republicans retain control of the House, and I'll assume that, which means some continued gridlock and, uh, and the inability of President Clinton to do it is probably more accurate than the first one. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Ottawa. Thanks to Domenico and his colleagues at CG for inviting me. We do and our Peterson Institute partner extensively with them, and that's here, and that's in Washington. And I'm delighted to be able to come. His timing was impeccable, as he implied himself, uh, to have me come up to talk about the outlook uh, in the U.S. Uh, literally two weeks before our coming election. Um, I will talk about two things in broad terms. One is what the election outcome is likely to do for our economy. Uh, I have the sense occasionally that Canadians care a little about the U.S. economy, uh, how it progresses, will it grow faster, will it be successful. And so I'll talk a little bit about what the election is likely to be for that. And then I'll talk about the trade issues, which are so, uh, so current and so uh, dramatic in our lives. Uh, I'll put your minds to rest at the start. I'm quite confident you'll get your seat up. Uh, I say that not because I have any inside knowledge of the current discussions in Brussels, but because I'm a close student of the European Union and have uh, been involved with it, and studied mm -hmm. it, and negotiated with it for most of my lengthy career in this business. And um, the way it works in Europe, which you would like to do on all counts. Um, but the majority, the Republican majority, will be reduced, and that will probably affect the outcome, too. So let me talk about the economic outlook. The most likely result of a Clinton presidency uh, is positive for the U.S. economy. Uh, the U.S. economy is currently doing quite well. Uh, five, uh, GDP growth is about two, but private final demand is growing two and a half or a little more. Uh, very little inflation pressure. Wages rising now two and a half to three percent. We're basically at full employment under five percent. Uh, so the economy is basically doing quite well. Um, in a way, it's somewhat similar to what's happening here in Canada. The two economies, as usual, to some extent, moving in, uh, in some concert. And what's going on here is widely appreciated and supported, I think, by virtually all quarters of the U.S. and uh, current governments. Uh, proceeding to deal with its problems, I think, quite effectively. Uh, but the U.S. baseline is quite positive. Uh, it's not great, but it's good. And all of the variables I mentioned are looking fine. The um, growth rate is modest, GDP growing about two. But as I say, private final demand, which is a better indicator, particularly for the impact on other countries, is growing more like two and a half. The difference is that our trade balance is getting worse. It's deteriorating by about half a percent of GDP a year. That's all those Canadian exports that you're sending us. Uh, and so uh, uh, 
So the infusion to world growth in the U.S. is better than the GDP numbers would indicate. Um, I think a Clinton administration will boost the U.S. outlook in two senses. Uh, in the short run, there will be an expansion of demand. There will be a modestly expansionary fiscal policy. It will be carried out in two or three ways. The main way is infrastructure investment. Again, something quite similar to what's going on here. Uh, President Clinton's main initiative will probably be spending of something like $50 billion in additional funding per year on infrastructure. She'll include the creation of a new infrastructure investment bank in order to finance some of that, share the funding with private sources in order to provide a more sustainable financing base for those arrangements. That will, of course, have double positive effect for the U.S. economy in the short run, it will expand demand, but it will also help deal with some of our structural problems, our poor infrastructure, and therefore will add to productivity growth over the medium to longer run. So that's a twofer. Um, the second thing that she'll do, and this may be the biggest uh, step she takes in terms of impact on the economy, The list is too long. Uh, it is a very prolific author. He has co-edited, co-authored uh, some of 44 books and of course several articles. Uh, shorter essays. So uh, without any further ado, I would like uh, uh, to turn over to you, Fred. For this uh, couldn't be a more timely talk on uh, the world economy, the US administration and the US Congress. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, well, Domenico, thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, including some things you did not say. Uh, it is true that USA Today said I was one of the 10 people who could change your life. But that's a partial quote. The full quote said, he's one of the 10 people who can change your life that you never heard of. <laughs> and unfortunately, the second part of the quote